Welcome to Dear Victoria Church Online. My name is John Hopkins and it's great to have you here. If it's your first time, what a blessing that you decided to click on this video. We would like to invite you to leave a comment below or send us a message on our Facebook page so that we can connect with you after this. For our dear family, thank you for joining us once again. And you'll know that we're busy with a series currently where Pastor Gary is speaking about the greatest sermon that was ever preached. And we're super excited about it. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the sermon with us. What a beautiful city. What a beautiful town. Everybody loves this town. It's situated in the land of milk and honey. Beautiful place. And everybody thinks it's situated in the perfect area. As you, as you look over the fields, you also see the Jordan River passing by. And it is a beautiful place. There's a lot of history here. A lot of wars have been fought here. And this is this great town, this wonderful town, Jericho. Jericho, a beautiful city. Everybody loves this city. Oh, and a few men gathered together one day and said, we are concerned. Have you ever been concerned about your city? Have you ever been concerned about the condition of your city? Have you ever been concerned about the town that you stay in and the condition of your town that you stay in? Oh, this is the interesting thing, that, that they were concerned about the condition. And I can imagine the Bible doesn't give us a clear picture of, 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 of their concerns when it comes to other people, but they, they could really see the potential of the city. But it seemed like that the life source in the city had a problem. That the thing that, that, that would draw people to a city was in trouble. And a few men got together discussing this up to a point where they didn't know how to answer this dilemma and what to do about this. So they ended up to going to the house of a prophet, prophet Elisha. Now, Elisha was just new um, to this whole prophet thing because he was under Elijah. And the, Elisha just got the mantle from El Elijah. And this was the first moment for him to, to display a miracle from God. Everybody knew about him and they knew that he was also in Jericho. Most probably, he was also concerned about the city. And the men of Jericho went to the house of Elisha. In 2 Kings 2, verse 19, it says, The, the people of the city said to Elisha, Look, our Lord, this town is well situated. There you have it again. That they would say, this is a beautiful town. It's well situated. It's a, it's a town that's supposed to flourish because of, because of where it's situated. It's next to the Jordan River. It's, it's just on the, on, on the other side. You go to Egypt and there's so many, so many, um, things around it that is so beautiful. This is a beautiful city, but they brought their concern to him and they said to him, it's well situated as you can see. Elisha, you also know this is a great city. And then they say, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Now, as I was preparing for this week's sermon, as I was, as I was just praying about this, 
this message that Jesus gave us um, in, in Matthew 5. So that's a completely different story. This story caught my eye. And I read this story and I read it over and over and over and over and over again. And I just couldn't, couldn't get past this story because I feel that this story and what happens here with this incredible miracle from Elijah is a is a symbol for all of us as followers of Jesus Christ if we have to think about his incredible sermon on the mount and therefore day of family i've got a message for you today day of family i've got something on my heart especially if you've ever been concerned about our city, if you've ever been concerned about the condition of Newcastle, if you've ever been concerned about any towns or cities in our country, in our region, if you've ever been concerned but you could see the potential, you're at the right place. Because this is what happens with the men of Jericho. They are concerned but they can see the potential. Oh, they love I love this city and I want to say I love my city. I love Newcastle. Maybe you're not from Newcastle and maybe you're uh, from another city or maybe you're not from Newcastle in South Africa. I don't know from where you are, but you know what? There's something about the city that we live in. There's something about the beautiful places that we live in. But uh, you see, when you see the potential in your city, when you see the potential, it's heartbreaking if there's something that that draws the energy, that takes the hope, that that destroys the potential of your city. And for these men, they ended up going to Elijah and saying that Elijah, we, we, we're concerned about our city because the life source, the water, the production of, of the fields, the, the unproductivity of the land because of the life source, because of the water that is dirty, that is bad. Uh, we're concerned of our city. You can just imagine. If the if 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 the land is unproductive and the water isn't isn't good to drink, you can just imagine that there isn't like an exodus out of the city. You can imagine that people are, are moving everywhere else because there's no jobs left. You can imagine that people are just going everywhere because it seems like this is just an uncontrollable situation. The Bible doesn't tell us why the water is bad. The Bible even doesn't, doesn't linger on this thing. And there's no history of why the water is bad. And, and, and I think what makes it worse is there's nobody to blame. In every situation, we want to blame someone. Someone needs to be blamed for what is happening. And even in our cities, we sometimes want to blame someone. We want to blame the, the mayor. We want to blame the municipality. We want to blame that guy. We want to blame our neighbor. We want to blame someone. But we find in this story, we find that nobody could be blamed. It is just that the water, the life source is bad. It's just bad. Oh, have you ever felt like that about Newcastle? Have you ever felt like that about other cities? Well, well, here is the answer, is in what happens in this miracle. And that I will connect with what Jesus did. When he, what Jesus said in his sermon on the mount. So, Elisha's response is this. Bring me a new bowl, he said. And put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And then he went out to the spring and he threw the salt into it. He just took a bucket of salt. This, it's this massive burden. It's this huge concern for everybody in the city. And he just takes one bucket of salt. He takes it to the, to the spring where the water starts of the city and he throws it in. And this is what Elijah says in his very first miracle. He says, this is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. 
Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day according to the word Elijah has had spoken. Oh, I, I want to say, follower of Jesus, I want to say, Deo family, I want to say, do not miss that the God that we serve still wants to do the miracle in our cities. That the God that we serve still wants to change the conditions of our towns. That the God that we serve can see beyond the hopelessness that we have. That the God that we serve has got solutions that we've never thought about and that doesn't seem like the right kind of answer. But the God that we serve is the God that says that I restore and He's the God that restores in this moment. He restores Jericho. Because the life source, the water of this town is being restored. Okay, you just imagine this moment with these men, with these men that felt the weight of this city. There's an exodus and everybody's going everywhere else and they are concerned. And they just say, we don't know at all. And just with all that burden, with all that weight, it seemed like there there had to be a lot of money being spent or there had to be other answers for this. And Elijah's response is, oh, I know the God that I serve and I know the God that, that, that what he's going to do and what he says. He says, just bring me a little bowl. Oh, this big burden. Just bring me a little bowl. Just bring me some salt. Just just put some salt in this. And I'm going to get some salt in the water because when I get some salt in the water, something's about to happen. Get the salt in the water. Well, that brings me to, to the greatest sermon ever. As Jesus sits next to the mountain, uh, and 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 Jesus speaks to his disciples many years later and he makes this incredibly big proclamation he says you are the salt of the earth you're the salt oh if you're my disciple if you're my follower, if you are the one that says, I follow you and, and, and I give you permission, Jesus, to make me a fisher of men. Jesus says in Matthew 5, he says, you are the salt of the earth. And then he says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. See, Jesus makes this big statement and he says that we are the salt of the earth. Get the salt in the water. If the salt is there, the city is restored. Oh, Elisha, if you get the salt in the water, if you get the salt and the salt is present, you will see a restoration in the city. And I am so excited. If you experience me as a little bit screaming or or, or just feeling very overwhelmed, I am just passionate today because... Because when I read the story, I felt, you know, this is for us. This is for us. This is for Newcastle. This is for the cities and the towns of our nation. The healing power of God over our nation, over our cities. This is for us that we should know that the, that this great miracle and this restoration of a city Uh, of the oldest city recorded in history, Jericho, in the midst of the hopelessness, is just, it's solved through salt. And Jesus says in this great sermon ever, he says, you're the salt 
Oh, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your presence in your city makes a difference. You see, there's a few observations, and maybe this is not new to you. Uh, this, this, this verse is not new to you. Hearing that we are the salt of the earth isn't new to you. You've most probably seen it on a poster before or on a vinyl or, or, or you've read this verse before. But I really want to just uh, bring back the heart of this verse to you today. Just a simple explanation of a few things in this verse that really excites me. Because we need to know that we are the salt of the earth. The first thing I want to mention is that Jesus used this, this metaphor of saying we're the salt of the earth. Now, we would, we would use salt as table salt. We would use salt um, in different ways in our household. And um, we would use salt and would say a lot of sermons and even sermons that I've preached before about this. I would say, you know what, uh, have you ever tasted some meat without salt it's not nice you need salt and we have all these different things about salt and that's great but i want to i want to say again after i read a lot of things about salt and and the whole context of what jesus was saying you must remember that this wasn't a statement about something small salt in the day of jesus was really very valuable. Some people, some scholars even, would argue that in some stages, and I don't think it is it is 100% like that, but in some stages in history, they would argue that salt was more valuable than gold. Some wars in history was fought not over gold or over oil, but over salt. You see, salt was essential. It brought life. It was an essential ingredient for everybody. And also they talk about it, that salt was one of the methods of payment that was used for the Roman soldiers. They would get paid, and some of their benefits would be a payment with salt. The word salary which we get payment from. It's also from a foreign language, which literally means salt. And in a way, it was their wages or their salary that they would receive. See, salt was very much very important. Now, the thing about the book of Matthew is that Matthew doesn't give this, this big explanation about what salt was used for in that time. But it's interesting. That Luke, the doctor, in the book of Luke, he talks about it. In Luke 14, he gives us a bit of a description about what Jesus says about the salt and why the salt is so necessary. So in Luke 14, in the very last verse, is the verse that I want to read to you, verse 35. Maybe I should start with verse 34. Verse 34 says, Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? But then verse 35, Jesus says these words. It's, he says, It is fit neither for the soil, not for the manure, Pile, it is thrown out. Whoever has an ear to hear, let them hear. And here Luke gives us a description of what Jesus said and what his context was when it came to, to speaking about the salt. You see, Jesus said it will not be useful if it loses its saltiness. It will not be useful for, first of all, for the soil. And secondly, for the manure pile. And that manure pile is actually human manure that they used to have in those days. You see, being close to the sea of um, to the Dead Sea, they would they would get the salt from the Dead Sea. And there's two things 
that was really important in that day that they would use the salt for. Two very important things. Firstly, they would use the salt to make the, the ground uh, or the soil productive so that the good fruits can grow. Salt was used to let the good fruits grow. But the second thing was also they would use salt in the manner of human beings. And in those piles, they would use the salt to kill the odors and the, the bad stuff so that bad stuff cannot grow in, the, in that manner. That's what the salt was used for. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, when he's speaking about salt, he's not just speaking about something that you put on your steak tonight. We say, just pass me the salt. You know, we sometimes just think that for our city and for our town, we should just be a good flavor. You know, they can be without us and they, they it will just be like a steak that, that doesn't have flavor, but you know, you'll get through it. But, uh, but flavor is good. No, it's not like that. Jesus. Jesus, when he says you're the salt of the earth, he was thinking that that salt brings the good, the good fruits to life and kills the bad stuff. That's what Jesus had in mind. When he says that we as followers of him, we as a Dio Victoria family, God's victory family, we we are the people that are in the city. And wherever we stay, we are there and our presence is there to help to cultivate the best and the good for that city. The good fruits, the love, the peace, the joy, the abundance. To cultivate that in our cities and to kill the corruption and the... And the, and, and the, the uh, I'd say the devastation of our cities and our towns. That is why Jesus says salt. Because it is so important. It was essential in his day to make the good stuff grow and the bad stuff to be killed. That's the salt. Second thing I want to mention just, uh, which is incredible, is that Jesus says you are the salt. Jesus doesn't use this as a command. It is not a command for you to be salt. It is not a, um, he, he's not telling you in your actions, in your deeds, in your thoughts even, to be salt. It is something that you are. It is a proclamation over your identity. It is like Jesus is saying, if you Follow me every day. If you, uh, your desire is to become like me, there is no option. It will come naturally. You'll naturally be the salt to your community. And therefore, it is not about an outreach strategy. It is not about doing good things here and there. No, it is that your presence in the city, it is that your presence as a next door neighbor, just just you being there, the way that you are, the way that your family life is, the way that your that that your life is when it comes to your community, when it comes to the supermarket, the way that you express just just what is in your heart to people around you, that is the salt. It's not something you can do. It's something who you are. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Yes, we can lose our saltiness, but therefore it is important for us to know that we are this. Because the losing of saltiness has nothing to do with, with one or two things that we do. It has everything to do with the condition of our hearts. It has everything to do with what, what happens inside of us, what happens in our thinking, what happens, what happens 
to us. Oh, and to Jesus it was important. It was important that the condition of our heart remains not to be offended, not to be bitter, so that we can know that we are the salt of the earth. Isn't it interesting that just before Jesus says that we are the salt of the earth, he speaks about us being persecuted. Oh, it is so, so real to all of us that when we get hurt, we can get offended. And isn't it maybe that Jesus is also trying to tell us just after he said, you will be persecuted for my name's sake, but take heart, you know, and, st and, and stand strong. But it's like Jesus wants to say after this, remember, you're the salt, but you can lose your flavor, but you are the salt. And it has to do with what happens in our hearts. That's what it has to do with. And Jesus says, you are the salt. Now, the third observation that I also do want to say is that Jesus' concern wasn't that you shake out the salt and, and the deeds about the salt. But again, he says, but if the salt loses its saltiness. Now, it's so interesting that, that, um, that the Greek word that Jesus used here and the Greek words that Jesus used around this picture of, of losing your flavor and losing your saltiness means being foolish. You know, it's when we, when we become foolish in just our own selfish desires. We need to be open. We need to be, we need to, to make sure that our hearts are pure. Because Jesus says, what happens in your heart will come from, will, will flow from your mouth. Therefore, it's so important for us to make sure who we are. Because that will change our city. I always tell parents, I always tell parents this about their children. You will teach them what you know, but you're going to reproduce who you are. Yes, so many parents tell me all the time, you know what, our kids are at a point where we want to, you know, we want to take them to church. We, it's time to take them to church. They must also learn church. If it's not your habit, you can, you can try and learn it to them now. If it's not your habit, it's not going to be their habit. You're going to teach them to go to church, but it will never be their habit. Because it's something that you just want to say, you want to do, but it's not something that you live. What you live is what your children will become. And it's the same with your community. It's who you are. If you live it every day, that's what your community will become, what your street will become, what your town will become, what our cities and our nation will become. So, what makes us more salty? Well, it's actually also the same thing. It's also trials in our life. It's also the persecution that sometimes helps us because we have to endure. The half-brother of Jesus, James, writes in, in James 1, verse 2 to 4. He, cons he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. It says that in those moments your faith is being tested. And, and if your faith is tested, you see, we all need our faith to be tested. And it's only trials, it's only difficult times, it's only the hurting times that test my faith. It tests what is truly in my heart. I can say a lot of things. I can do things that look like I'm a I'm really a follower, but it tests my heart. And it says, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And then he says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. There's only one way for us to get mature. 
and be complete, not lacking in who we are. It's through trials. Because those moments reveal to us. There's nothing like a time when, when you are faced in a trial, especially even with, with other followers of Jesus Christ. Or with situations that's close to your heart. It exposes your heart. And it makes you think again. It makes you consider again the words that you use in situations. And it makes you long even more to be like Jesus. Well, in Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. And if you lose your saltiness, how will it be salt again? I just feel Deo family, Deo Victoria. Our name says God's victory. And my prayer during this whole lockdown time is that God's victory will become our reality. Not just for me and you as followers of Jesus Christ, but for our city, for Newcastle, for our province, for KwaZulu-Natal, for our nation that God's victory will become our reality. And it might, might sound very simple what I'm sharing today, but it's not easy. Because it's not determined by what I do. It's not an evangelism strategy. But it is rather who I become. Behind closed doors. It's rather who I become in the presence of the King. That's what makes the difference. And yes, I know it might seem easy, but that's the great thing. That's the great thing about the God that we serve is that Christ in us, Christ in us, He's the hope of glory. The great thing is that, that with that city in two kings too, when all those men came to Elisha with all the burdens, they said, it must be a very difficult answer to this question. Please, will you help us? Just tell us what we should do. And it was an easy answer. Just salt in the water. Just get the salt in the source. Just live that life. And I want to call on you. I want to call on you. Just get the salt in there. Because we are the salt of the earth. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be in your presence. What a privilege it is to read your word. What a privilege it is to find life and hope in your word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is full of moments of miracles. Thank you that your word reveals so much to us, even in our circumstances, and that, that we can see even the heart of the Father. And Father, and thank you that even in these moments, that we can know that that the greatest sermon ever that was spoken by Jesus himself, Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, it was you. And the words that you spoke on that mountain brought an impact, and I pray that it will make an impact in our lives. I pray, Father, that we will take these words and that it will not be information because of its information. God, we've heard this so many times. We are the salt of the earth, but I pray today for transformation. I pray that we will be transformed from the inside out and that it will be an overflowing from our whole being, that just us being in the city just in the way that we live life will bring the good stuff from the soil. 
and that will kill the bad stuff. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we can trust you today and thank you that we can know that we can know that it is you inside of us that is the hope of glory. It is you working in and through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm really excited today about this word. And my prayer is really that you will be transformed. My prayer is really that you will live this life. Because salt is valuable. Much more valuable than what we thought. And you are valuable. Much more valuable than what you think. And you're valuable to God and you're essential to Him and His mission in our city. You're valuable to His mission in our city. Live a life. Live a life that is worthy of that call. God bless.